his massive chest. He stared down at the boy in the red zip-up jacket and shook his shaved head. You can't bring that thing in here. The fifty or so teenagers in line outside the pandemonium club leaned forward to eavesdrop. It was a long wait to get into the all-ages club, especially on a Sunday, and not much generally happened in line. The bouncers were fierce and would come down instantly.
smile curled her lips. She moved to the side and he could see that she was leaning against a closed door. No admittance. Storage. Was scrawled across in red paint. She reached behind her for the knob, turned it, slid inside. He caught a glimpse of stacked boxes, tangled wiring. Storage room. He glanced behind him. No one was looking. So much the better if she wanted privacy. He slipped into the room after her, unaware that he was being followed. So, Simon said, pretty good music, eh? Clary didn't reply. They were dancing, or what passed for it. A lot of swaying back and forth with occasional lunges forward of the floor as if one of them had dropped an contact lens. In a space between a group of teenage boys in metallic corsets and a young Asian couple who were making out passionately, their colored hair extensions tangled his parachute pants flapping in the breeze from the wind machine. Clary wasn't paying much attention to their immediate surroundings. Her eyes were on the blue-haired boy who talked his way into the club. He was prowling through the crowd as if he were looking for something. There was something about the way he moved that reminded her of something. I, for one, Simon went on, am enjoying myself immensely. This seemed unlikely. Simon, as always, stuck out of the club like a sore thumb in jeans and an old t-shirt that said Made in Brooklyn across the front. His freshly scrubbed hair was dark brown instead of green or pink, and his glasses perched crookedly on the end of his nose. He looked less like he were contemplating the powers of darkness, and more as if he were on his way to a chess club. <laughs> Clary knew perfectly well that he came to pandemonium with her only because she liked it, that he thought it was boring. She wasn't even sure why it was that she liked it. The clothes, the music, made it like a dream. Someone else's life. Not her boring real life at all. But she was always too shy to talk to anyone but Simon. The blue-haired boy was making his way off the dance floor. He looked a little lost, as if he hadn't found whom he was looking for. Clary wondered what would happen if she went up and introduced herself, offered to show him around. Maybe he'd just stare at her. Or maybe he was shy, too. Maybe he'd be grateful and pleased and try not to show it the way boys did. But she'd know. Maybe. The blue-haired boy straightened up suddenly, snapping to attention like a hunting dog on a point. Clary followed his line of gaze and saw the girl in the white dress. Oh, well, Clary thought, trying not to feel like a deflated party balloon. I guess that's that. The girl was gorgeous. The kind of girl Clary like to draw, tall and ribbon slim, with a long spill of black hair. Even at this distance, Clary could see the red pendant around her throat. It pulsed under the lights of the dance floor like a separate, disembodied heart. I feel, Simon went on, that this evening, DJ Pat is doing a singularly exceptional job. Don't you agree? Clary rolled her eyes and didn't answer. Simon hated trans music. Her attention was on the girl in the white dress. Through the darkness, smoke, and artificial fog, her pale dress shone out like a beacon. No wonder the blue-haired boy was following her as if he were under a spell, too distracted to notice anything else around him, even the two dark shapes hard on his heel, weaving after him through the crowd. Clary slowed her dancing and stared. She could just make out that the shapes were boys, tall and wearing black clothes. She couldn't have said how she knew that they were following the other boy, but she did. She could see it in the way they paced him, their careful watchfulness, the slinking grace of their movements. A small flower of apprehension began to open inside her chest. Meanwhile, Simon added, I wanted to tell you that lately I've been cross-dressing. Also, I'm sleeping with your mom. I thought you should know. The girl had reached the wall and was opening a door marked no admittance. She beckoned after her, and they slipped through the door. It wasn't anything Clary hadn't seen before, a couple sneaking off to the dark corners of the club to make out. But that made it even weirder that they were being followed. She raised herself up on tiptoe, trying to see over the crowd. The two guys had stopped at the door and seemed to be conferring with each other. One of them was blonde, the other dark-haired. The blonde one reached into his jacket. 
step forward. 
were slitted. 
his face. Chase to you. He never got to finish his sentence. At that moment, the blue-haired boy, with a high, yowling cry, tore free of his restraints, binding him to the pillar, and flung himself on Chase. They fell to the ground and rolled together, the blue-haired boy tearing at Chase with hands that glittered as if tipped in metal. Clary backed up, wanting to run, but her feet caught on the loop of wiring, and she went down, knocking the breath out of her chest. She could hear Isabel shrieking. Rolling over, Clary saw the blue-haired boy sitting on Chase's chest. Blood gleamed at the tips of his razor-like claws. Isabel and Alec were running towards them, Isabel brandishing a whip in her hand. The blue-haired boy slashed at Chase's face with claws extended. Chase threw an arm up to protect himself, and the claws raked into splattering blood. The blue-haired boy lunged again, and Isabel's whip came down across his back. He shrieked side. Swift as a flick of Isabel's whip, Chase rolled over. There was a blade gleaming in his hand. He sunk the knife into the blue-haired boy's chest. Blackish liquid exploded around the hilt. The boy arched off the floor, gurgling and twisting. With a grimace, Chase stood up. His black shirt was blacker now, in some places wet with blood. He looked down at the twisting form at his feet, reaching down and yanked out the knife. The hilt was sealed. The blue-haired boy's eyes flicked open. His eyes, fixed on Chase, seemed to burn. Between his teeth he hissed, So be it. The Forsaken will take you all. Chase seemed to snarl. The boy's eyes rolled back. His body began to jerk and twist as he crumpled, folding in on himself, growing smaller and smaller until he vanished entirely. Clary scrambled to her feet, kicking free of the electrical wiring. She began to back away. None of them was paying attention to her. Alec had reached Chase and was holding his arm, pulling at the sleeve, probably trying to get a good look at the wound. Clary turned to run and found her way blocked by Isabel whip in hand. The cold length of it was stained with dark fluid. She flipped it toward Clary and the end wrapped itself around her wrist and jerked tight. Clary gasped with pain and surprise. Stupid little Mundy, Isabel said between her teeth. You could have gotten Chase killed. He's crazy, said Clary, trying to pull her wrist back. The whip bit deeper into her skin. You're all crazy. What do you think you are, vigilante killers? The police... The police aren't usually interested unless you can produce a body, said Chase, cradling his arm. He picked his way across the cable-strewn floor towards Clary. Alec followed behind him, face screwed into a scowl. Clary glanced at the spot where the boy had disappeared from and said nothing. There wasn't even a smear of blood there. Nothing to show that the boy had ever existed. They return to their home dimension when they die, said Jace, in case you were wondering. Jace! Alec hissed. Be careful. Jace drew his arm away. A ghoulish freckling of blood marked his face. He still reminded her of a lion. With his wide-spaced, light-colored eyes and tawny gold hair, she can see us, Alec, he said. She already knows too much. So what do you want me to do with her? Isabel demanded. Let her go, said Jace. Isabel shot him a surprised, almost angry look, but didn't argue. The whip slithered away, freeing Clary's arm. She rubbed her sore wrist and wondered how the hell she was going to get out of there. Maybe we should bring her back with us, Alec said. I bet Hodge would like to talk to her. Institute, said Isabel. She's a Mundy. Or is she? said Chase softly. His quiet tone was worse than Isabel snapping or Alec's anger. Have you had dealings with demons, little girl? Walked with the warlocks? Talked with the night children? Have you? My name is not little girl, Clary interrupted, and I have no idea what you're talking about. Don't you? said the voice in the back of her head. You saw that into thin air. Chase isn't crazy. You just wish he was. I don't believe in... in demons or whatever you... Clary? It was Simon's voice. She rolled around. He was standing by the storage room door. One of the burly bouncers who'd been stamping hands in front of the door was next to him. Are you okay? He peered at her through the gloom. Why are you in here by yourself? What happened to the guys, you know, the ones with the knives? Clary stared at him and then looked behind her, where Jace, Isabel, and Alec stood. Jace still in his bloody shirt, with the knife in his hand. He grinned at her and dropped a half-apologetic, half-mocking shrug. Clearly he 
wasn't surprised that neither Simon nor the bouncer could see them. Somehow, neither was Clary. Slowly, she turned her back to Simon, knowing how she must look to him standing alone in the damp storage room, her feet tangled in bright plastic wiring cables. I thought they went in here, she said lamely, but I guess they didn't. I'm sorry. She glanced from Simon, whose expression was changing from worry to embarrassed, to the bouncer, who just looked annoyed. It was a mistake. Behind her, Isabel giggled. I don't believe it, Simon said stubbornly, as Clary, standing at the curb, tried desperately to hail a cab. Street cleaners had come down the orchard while they were inside the club, and the street was glossed black with oily water. I know, she agreed. You'd think there'd be some cabs. Where is everyone going at midnight on a Sunday? She turned back to him, shrugging. You think we'll have better luck on Houston? Not the cabs, Simon said. You, I don't believe you. I don't believe that those guys with the knives just disappeared. Clary sighed. Maybe there weren't any guys with knives, Simon. Maybe I just imagined the whole thing. No way. Simon raised his hand over his head, but the oncoming taxis whizzed by him, spraying dirty water. I saw your face when I came into that storage room. You looked seriously freaked out, like you'd seen a ghost. Clary thought of Chase with his lion cat eyes. She glanced down at her wrist, braceleted by a thin red line where Isabel's whip had curled. No, not a ghost, she thought. Something even weirder than that. It was just a mistake, she said wearily. She wondered why she wasn't telling him the truth, except, of course, that he'd think she was crazy, and there was something about what had happened, something about the black blood bubbling up around Chase's knife. Something about his voice when he'd said, Have you talked with the night children? That she wanted to keep to herself. Well, it was a hell of an embarrassing mistake, Simon said. He glanced back at the club, where a thin line still snaked out of the door and hallway down the block. I doubt the lover led us back into pandemonium. What do you care? You hate pandemonium. Clary raised her hand again as a yellow shade sped towards them through the fog. This time, though, the taxi screeched to a halt at their corner, the driver laying into his horn as if he needed 